All right, let's see how I can wake you up at that time of the day. So the most important word in this title is towards, actually. So because uh, we are very much at the beginning, but still it's an attempt to get forward. You can see there are a lot of collaborators of the work I'm going to present today and some related work. And actually quite a number of these people are in the audience. You can talk with them yourself. So the question that I've been bordering with is what are the fundamental phenomena that we need to care about in the social sciences. And that's maybe a subjective list that I'm going to present to you. Uh, but I guess at least some of you would agree that among these um, points are uh, points that uh, have been identified by many other scholars as uh, a very important issue. So homophily has been mentioned right in the last talk and also before. Uh, so the tendency to interact with similar people, but why is that happening? Uh, social influence is a subject I will not talk about today, but cooperation in social dilemma situation will be addressed. Group identity will not be addressed, but uh, social norms, social differentiation, um, and I will not talk about social structure, deviance and crime, social exchange and conflicts, but that's somehow on the agenda for future work. And let me explain you a little bit what is my approach towards trying to getting a better understanding of these kinds of phenomena. I'm trying to start off in a bottom-up way, trying to understand those phenomena as a result of emergence and self-organization in social systems. That means as an outcome of uh, individual interactions. And then the question is, what uh, should be the assumptions we should make in such a model? And we should try to avoid putting into the model what we want to get out. So let's uh, stay elementary. And some of the facts I think that most people would not um, question is that uh, birth and death and reproduction are facts. We can safely put into our models Individuals need resources, there's competition, there's tool making ability, perception, curiosity, emotions, memory, mobility, communication, learning, and teaching ability, the possibility of trading and exchange, and so on and so on. But if you would put all of these features into one single model, it would be possible in a simplified way somehow, and then we would come up basically with a computer game with a lot of parameters in it, and we would not be able to identify clearly anymore what are the cause and effect relationships. So what usually is the approach is we start simple, and then over time, that could be decades actually, we get more and more sophisticated in our modeling approach. So we start off with looking at separate facts uh, as mentioned over here, and what are the implications of those, and we look at binary interactions between those facts, and then uh, we focus on the combination of three elements, and so on, and so on, in order to get a fundamental understanding. And here are some keywords that are highlighted, uh, the ones that are shown in black are in one way or another inbuilt in the models that I'm going to talk about, but in a very simplified way. Um, still, it seems that um, we can understand certain phenomena based on these kinds of approaches. And um, let me start off with an example that actually brought me in contact with game theory. So when I did my diploma thesis, I was studying pedestrians. And it turns out that uh, people are not just walking in a random way, but there is some order in the crowd, as you can see. So there's a segregation phenomenon. People walking into different directions are walking on different sides, actually. And uh, this kind of behavior, in particular the segregation into lanes, 
of uniform walking direction can be understood with very simple models such as this one. We assume that there are repulsive interactions between individuals. Individuals enter at random locations and then they're walking forward so there's a destination on the other side. We can see that through these interactions a self-organization takes place and we find these lanes of uniform walking direction as a result of individual interactions. We do, don't have to assume over here that people uh, would try to find optimal passes. We just assume very simple interactions. And in some sense also that reminds a little bit of Adam Smith's idea of an invisible hand, uh, which um, basically states that markets self-organize. Um, by the way, there are limits of this uh, self-organization in the sense that not always self-organization would lead to a favorable result. We know crowd disasters are happening in pedestrian crowds sometimes, very sadly. And so self-organization can break down or there could, could be other forms of self-organization that we would not like to see. As also we've seen, there were problems with financial markets recently. Uh, so self-organization is not a guarantee of a uh, favorable outcome. Anyway, um, what I noticed furthermore was that there was a preference for one side that pedestrians had. For example, in continental Europe, most people tend to have a preference for the right-hand side. And in fact, it turns out that this helps uh, pedestrians to get around each other. So in many cases, we have these situations where we face another pedestrian and then we can go either right or left. So we have two behavioral options as shown over here. We have two pedestrians, so in some sense it's a two-player game. And if both of them go right, then they manage to pass each other. And so there is a positive payoff. And uh, if one of them goes right and the other one goes left, then they're standing in front of each other again. They have not succeeded, so there is no payoff, and they have to try again. And similar for the left-hand side. So we have this payoff matrix over here. It's well known to you, of course. It's a coordination game. And it's possible to come up uh, with replicator equations, which basically describe how the relative proportion of these two behaviors changes over time, um, assuming that uh, the change would be proportional to the difference between the expected uh, payoff of a strategy and the average expected payoff. And on the other hand, proportional also to the number of people who could actually change the behavior. Now, plugging in this particular payoff matrix, we get uh, the um, expected payoff shown over here and the average expected sh uh, payoff shown over here. And then eventually, we can find this replicator equation for the coordination game, which of course is well known to you. But let me uh, nevertheless um, shortly summarize what it says. So there are three stationary solutions that are found by putting the time derivative to zero. One of them is 50% of people go to the right and 50% of people go to the left. And another solution is 100% of people going to the right. And uh, the third uh, stationary solution is 100% of people going uh, to the left. Now, the next step in the analysis usually is a stability analysis, so you would determine the, the eigenvalues, and it turns out that, interestingly enough, this 50-50 solution, which seems to be a natural starting condition for the game, uh, is not stable. That means a small variation in the fraction of people favoring uh, one behavior over the other would eventually lead into one of those two stable solutions with the majority of people doing the same thing. So basically that establishes uh, the formation of a behavioral convention and um, that is something that I already formulated also with uh, mathematical formulas in my diploma thesis. And um, of course, it's still relevant. Now the question is what happens if we have other payoff matrices which are quantifying the success of interactions of people. And let me say uh, at this instance that I personally believe that evolution game theory is a very powerful and flexible approach um, which has 
a chance uh, to describe uh, social interactions. So for me, it's uh, in some sense the equivalent uh, to em elementary particle uh, physics, uh, which is an uh, interaction theory for physical particles. Would not claim that evolution game theory is as advanced in terms of you know, the mathematical formalism, but I think we can get there actually. So um, I think this um, approach is quite promising. We'll show you a number of examples to motivate that further. And the probably most mentioned uh, two by two game is the prisoner's dilemma, and we've heard about it many times also during this conference already. So that has a particular payoff structure which makes it a social dilemma. And in particular, in that situation, people have two options again, either to cooperate or not to cooperate, we say to defect. And um, the payoffs are chosen in a way that it's kind of tempting to defect and risky to cooperate, with uh, the result that people are expected to end up defecting. In particular, if we plug in this payoff matrix into the replicator equation I have shown you before, so we would end up with uh, what we call a tragedy of the commons, actually. And let me add that the prisoner's dilemma could be understood as a special case of public goods games with two players. Public goods game is also a social dilemma situation. I'll talk uh, a lot about both of those uh, two particular instances of uh, social dilemma situations. So the question is why is social cooperation so important and so interesting? Well, everything from public services and infrastructures we're protecting our environment up to social benefit systems and language and culture require cooperative contributions. And as I said before, social cooperation is expected to break down if selfish rewriting generates better payoffs, so there is a temptation actually uh, to defect. And um, the generation of public goods, in particular of society in many aspects, as I indicated before, requires to overcome this tragedy of the commons. It means the tendency of defection. And the question is, how can we do that? What mechanisms uh, would uh, do the trick? And many people have been working on this, uh, a lot of bright and interesting uh, contributions. Cooperation is one of the... 25 most important scientific problems, according, I think, uh, to, to science, and um, I uh, think this is actually true. Um, if social cooperation would not happen, then societies, I claim, would not exist, and we would have a war of everybody against everybody else. This is not something that I invented. Uh, you know the saying, homo hominis lupus, which is um, actually exactly the same thing in Latin. Um, so the challenge is to understand how to overcome the tragedy of the commons. Um, taxes and the state enforcing cooperation are one solution, we know that. Taxes actually change uh, the payoff matrix and the structure of the game and then it would not necessarily be a, a social dilemma anymore, but that's simple. So the question is, are there better tricks, actually, or other tricks uh, to reach cooperation even uh, when the um, public goods game or the prisoner's dilemma are present. Um, so before I want to go into the modeling, I want to list a few stylized facts um, that we observe in societies and that uh, we want to reproduce by our models. I always tell my students that they should not just uh, come up with a model, but first of all say what do they want to understand, what are the questions. And so we want to understand why individuals tend to agglomerate. Um, we want to understand why individuals tend to segregate. And why the level of cooperation in experimental persons dilemma and public goods situations is higher of expect uh, than expected according to what I said before. I mean, it's usually, at least in the beginning, we don't see a tragedy of the commons, and then over time, well, it depends on the rules. Um, so, uh, the other thing that we know is individuals' behaviors are partially determined by the social environment. 
and social environments persist much longer than an individual contributes to it. So a company exists for a long time. By that time, many people have changed their jobs and so on. Um, and social systems adapt continuously. Now, the model that we came up with is combining two different mechanisms. One is imitation of the best performing neighbors. And you can see over here three different colors. Uh, red is representing defectors and blue is representing cooperators and in between there is white empty space. Um, and that will be needed actually for the modeling of success driven migration and we'll go into this later on. So let's have a look at the situation where we uh, start off with 50% cooperators and uh, people are imitating the best performing neighbor. Now what you can see is actually as expected, defection is spreading, but as we have assumed, uh, deterministic imitation will over here. Um, the situation freezes after a short time and that's it. We'll talk about the impact of noise imitation later on. <laughs> so imitation doesn't do the trick of uh, spreading cooperation and increasing the level of cooperation. Let's have a look at uh, success during migration. So in that case, if it doesn't come with imitation, then of course everybody sticks to the behavior, um, but people could change their location. And we stay with 50% cooperators. Let's see what happens as a result of the success during migration. So how does it happen? Actually, people would look uh, within a certain radius around their current position. What would be maybe a better location if they moved over there? So they do something like virtual interactions. And if they would earn a higher payoff, then uh, they would move to the best location within this radius. And so what you can see as a result of that, uh, there is actually an agglomeration process. So cooperators tend to stay close to each other and uh, close to these cooperative clusters, there are the defectors. Uh, so we, we have something like um, agglomeration here and also segregation. It's not very pronounced. But let me state that both of these me mechanisms are not capable of increasing the level of cooperation. So in some sense, both of them fail. So we would not expect that combining those uh, would do anything interesting. Why should mobility actually have a positive effect on cooperation? But in fact, if we combine the two mechanisms, it turns out very surprisingly that now the level of cooperation is increasing enormously. So we have large cooperative clusters over here. Uh, this model society keeps uh, changing. So there's still some defectors, again, at the boundaries of the clusters. And um, so this is something quite interesting, and we need to understand that better. But um, obviously, cooperators are doing well in the cooperative environment. And um, this cooperative environment seems also to stabilize uh, cooperative behavior. So it's a little bit like what I described to you before, that there is this social milieu effect that uh, the environment is uh, influencing people's behaviors. But at the same time, the social environment is made up of the people's behavior. So this is something we find in this oversimplified model, but still, I think it's interesting. Interesting. But let's go a little bit more into detail. So why is this happening? Why is the combination of these two mechanisms uh, so successful in promoting cooperation? Well, let's have another look at um, success through migration in separation. So no imitation here. But we look at uh, the influence of different kinds of payoff matrices. And what you can see is that even though in all these simulations, we start off with homogeneous distribution of behaviors in space. Uh, over time, there is a pattern formation. And there are different patterns depending on the payoff matrices. You can see in this case, there is segregation, very similar to the lane formation I've shown you before. Um, also, there could be repulsive agglomeration, so not all the space is used, but uh, again, the two different behaviors would uh, end up in different places. That could be maybe called ghetto formation. 
And uh, over here is a case of attractive agglomeration where the two behaviors end up in the uh, same locations, actually. Uh, but not all the space is being used. So it's a clustering phenomenon. And uh, we have done that also uh, for the parameter combinations that are relevant for the prisoner's dilemma. So all what is below this diagonal line is the prisoner's dilemma. So RPTS are the usual abbreviations for the payoffs in the prisoner's dilemma. So T is temptation, P is punishment, R is reward, and S is sucker's payoff. And above this diagonal line, we have the snow drift game. What you can see over here, red are the parameter combinations where we stay with a uniform distribution over time. So it's a very small parameter area, actually, where we don't have pattern formation. In all the other parameter areas, actually, pattern formation occurs, which means agglomeration and segregation. And one can do that even with m many, many more strategies, as is shown over here, uh, for uh, two simulations, which I won't explain in more detail, but you can see, I think there were 10 different strategies over here. I can see a clear tendency of uh, same colors to end up next to each other. So we have actually these birds of a feather flock together phenomenon, which is called homophily. So success during migration is promoting such a birds of a feather flock together phenomenon. Um, and uh, I think imitation is doing that also to a certain extent, but uh, somehow success during migration is promoting that very much. And of course, uh, there are some analogies to Schelling's model. You have certainly thought about that. But we haven't put that model in. It's basically coming out from the success during migration, which is using the same payoff matrix that specifies the interaction outcome between individuals. Now, the question is, how robust is this finding? And uh, so people have been asking, what happens if a defector manages to intrude a cooperative cluster? Would it be possible to erode cooperation from within? And so we introduced um, mutations. We are starting off here with a city where everybody cooperates in the beginning, and then forget about uh, success to remigration for a moment and just look at uh, imitation of the best neighbors and at these mutations that would flip the behaviors of individuals with a certain probability. And what you can see under these conditions is that even though everybody starts off cooperative, we end up with a higher and higher level of defection. It means Again, we have this strategy of the commons that we started off with. So actually, it's very bad news, but also that's something that we expected, that noise would actually be harmful for uh, cooperative clusters. And we have also been looking at other kinds of noise, in particular long-range uh, relocation. So sometimes people are moving from Germany to US and vice versa, or to Japan, whatsoever, we can see again, if we combine imitation of the best neighbors with this long range random relocation, then we end up with a tragedy of the commons. That means noise is really very harmful in the imitation only scenario. So the question is what happens if we combine uh, imitation of the best performing neighbors with success driven migration. That's a scenario that I'm showing you over here. And to make it a bit more interesting, we're starting off with defection only. And when I asked my PhD student whether he'd ever uh, done such a simulation, he said, well, we don't even need to try that because nothing will happen. Um, and then after a few weeks, I asked again, have you done it in the meantime? And he said, no. And then I've been sitting next to him and waiting what would happen. And in fact, he was right for five minutes. And uh, so we start off with defection only. You can see through these uh, long range uh, relocations, uh, the cluster dissolves, but most people defect. But then after a very 
large number of iterations, we find by coincidence this formation of a supercritical cooperative cluster. So it needs to be large enough for that. We need to be uh, wait long enough. And however, if that happens, then you can see cooperation is spreading quickly in the system. And that was really exciting. And we uh, coined it the outbreak of cooperation because really for a very long time, the level of cooperation stays ridiculously slow. Uh, just a, a few mutations that uh, make it different from zero, but it's enough to make uh, this coincidence of cooperation in a small neighborhood happen after some time. And once that happens, a very quick spreading of cooperation takes place. And it doesn't require a particular initial condition or some luck. It happens always. So we have done it many times. You can see over here the standard deviation. So it ends up with cooperation. So that is really fantastic. The question is, does it happen only in the computer? So is it a, a theoretically nice finding, but uh, practically irrelevant? And so uh, we uh, were comparing this with experiments. And here is an experiment which does not directly relate actually uh, to the prisoner's dilemma, but again, it's a two players interaction. Uh, we called it the root choice game, where people go from um, an origin town A to a destination town B every day, and there are two alternative roads, a freeway and a small road. and. Um, Everybody would like to use the freeway, but then this gets congested somehow, and it's uh, better if cars are distributing of these two alternative roads. Um, however, uh, the system optimum is kind of uh, reached only by a sacrifice of those people who are using this small road over here. So why should they be willing actually to use the small road. And so the question is what's happening in this uh, experiment. We've done it for a different number of players, uh, in particular also for a two-player version. And here this graph shows you where the root choice game is located as compared to the prisoner's dilemma, the chicken game, battle of the sexes, and so on and so on. Um, the situation is like this. So uh, in principle, <laughs> From the system's point of view, it's good if we have one player using the freeway and the other player using the small road. But uh, the player on the small road, of course, gets a much smaller payoff, so he gets upset. He also wants to use the freeway. And uh, if the other person is not willing uh, to switch to the small road, then basically both individuals end up on the freeway, and it's very bad for both players. Now, here are some experimental results. So we have run that really for a large number of iterations. That is very important, as you can see, because people have a tendency to use uh, the freeway, which is um, the, the uh, decision to uh, but on the other hand, sometimes they're trying the other alternative. And then sooner or later it happens that, again by coincidence, they are taking turns. That means one of them was on the freeway, the other one on the small road, and then in the next iteration they happen to do uh, it the other way around. So that means the one who was on the freeway before is switching to the small road and uh, vice versa. And that turns out to be very favorable because it establishes a system optimum and also it's um, user optimal. So somehow people learn, hey, this is a good solution actually for us. It's performing much better than if we end up using the freeway. And so there is an outbreak of turn taking in this case, again after a very long time. Um, let me go into another model before I show you another experiment. So one criticism we heard about this migration model was that uh, the way we implemented the success-driven 
migration. Because we basically tested an environment uh, where people would move assuming virtual interaction. So we assumed basically people could ex assess um, how nice the environment would be if they moved there. Of course, the environment could change over time quite quickly, but still somehow people could guess what would be a good environment and what would be a bad environment. So um, Ernst Fair, for example, asked, isn't that a green beard effect? And I said, mm -hmm. I don't think this is the issue over here. But then we came up with another uh, model uh, together with Carlos Roca, who is sitting here in the audience. And that model does not assume that people could actually detect what strategy other people are playing or uh, find out about their payoff. So we have been very strict over here assuming that uh, individuals would just have a memory of their previous experiences. And they actually are quite bad me memory, so they're forgetting over time. Um, and basically, they remember uh, the, the highest payoff and the lowest payoff. But uh, as you can see over here, also, if that's a long time ago, they wouldn't rem remember it so much. And then they have a certain expectation uh, which is between the minimum and the maximum payoff. And we call that expectation parameter the greediness of the individual. So if you expect to get 60% uh, of the maximum remembered payoff, then you're 60% greedy in, in some sense. Um, and then uh, so somehow uh, this defines the satisfaction level, so the expectation regarding the payoff. If uh, the payoff that uh, the individual receives in the next time step is above this expectation level and people are happy, uh, if it's below, then people are dissatisfied. And uh, then the more dissatisfied they are, the more likely they are to change either their location or their strategy. So in some sense, it's a generalized uh, win-stay-lose-shift rule, one could say. It's also related uh, to the concept of satisfying. So individuals are not trying to find the optimal behavior, just uh, have certain expectations regarding how much payoff they would like to get. And um, if they're happy, then they do the same thing. And if uh, they're unhappy, they're trying to find a better place in the world or um, find a better um, behavior to get a better payoff, which makes, I think, a lot of sense. And then based on this, we again find actually uh, that there is uh, agglomeration of cooperators and that this agglomeration comes also with an increased level of cooperation. So again, we have a co-evolution over here between spatial organization and behavior. That's something which is related to the correlated dynamics that uh, previous speakers have been referring to. So correlations are really the essence over here. And now the question is, how does that actually depend on the parameters that we're choosing? So we were particularly interested in the effect of greediness. And we said, OK, let's start with a very low level of greediness and uh, see what happens. And it turns out it's not good for um, this model society. So the level of uh, aggregation and cooperation is low. Uh, in particular, the cooperation is a very low level because people don't have any expectation. They're just happy with what they have. So why should they make an effort? Now, if they're getting more greedy, then they can only be happy by really reaching something. And reaching something here happens by cooperation in this public goods game. So um, cooperation pays off somehow. That allows individuals to get uh, a better payoff. And so that is actually stimulating cooperation, as you can see. So uh, some greediness is good. Uh, for society, it, it causes um, agglomeration and cooperation, a combination of which we call social cohesion. And so given that situation, one could think, okay, 
if uh, increasing the greediness is increase, uh, in increasing the level of cooperation, then why shouldn't people get more greedy? Because it turned out to be good in the past, right? So it would be logical that people would get more and more greedy. So we go up this line over here, and uh, uh, that is the greediness. Uh, and you can see, for a long time, cooperation, agglomeration are fine, but then there is a certain level, something like a tipping point, uh, where suddenly people are hard to satisfy. Because it's very really difficult to find conditions under which people could reach their expectations. So they're on the move all the time, social agglomeration falls apart, and also social cooperation cannot happen anymore. So we find something like a breakdown of cohesion over here, and it reminds a little bit of the rise and fall of society stories that we can find in some history books when we can read that uh, some high cultures have suddenly disappeared, surprisingly, and there's still a controversial discussion about the mechanism leading to that. Um, I'm not claiming that would be the ultimate explanation, but at least it's a stimulating finding, also in the context of uh, the financial market instability. Now, we have done an experiment based on this model, very recently, to, together again with uh, Carlos Rocca, Charles Efferson, and Sonia Vogt, and we have compared uh, a situation with migration uh, in a, a spatial grid with a situation without migration, which is our uh, control experiment. And uh, at least now voluntary migration. And you can see that uh, for the control treatment, we find the expected result. People start off with a certain level of uh, cooperation, but uh, soon get frustrated and end up with a very low level of cooperation. So we find the tragedy of the commons that I've been starting off with. However, migration can keep a high level of cooperation alive in the system. So really, uh, that is quite interesting. And uh, you can see in this evaluation over here that there is uh, uh, quite some difference in the average payoff uh, in between the two scenarios with migration and without migration. And actually, mobility is key to success. So um, I think that is important to consider when you're trying to understand cooperation. In fact, uh, the relevance of mobility is increasingly recognized, I would say. So you heard as fair referring to this paper yesterday. And also here's another paper by Richardson Boyd, uh, which highlight migration. So uh, somehow, there is an in increasing recognition that mobility can be quite helpful for the evolution of cooperation. But also costly punishment. Costly punishment is something that many people have investigated. And so let's have a look at the situation where we have a bigger parameter space. So not only the possibility to cooperate and to defect, but uh, cooperators could also punish defectors, and we call those moralists. And uh, we are also considering defectors who are punishing defectors and call them immoralists because they're behaving in a hypocritical way. Now, as indicated, punishment is costly. So the big question is, why would people punish at all? Um, why wouldn't we find a second order free rider dilemma? First order free rider dilemma refers, of course, to the people not paying a contribution to the public good, and that's why they're free riding. Second order free rider dilemma refers not um, contributing to the sanctioning of non cooperative behavior. Yes, in fact, it would be much cheaper if other people would do the punishment for you because punishment is stressful, it may require a lawyer, it can be costly, and so on. So uh, certainly, it's usually not for free. Um, so one of the big questions over here is, why don't we have a second order free rider dilemma? Um, and let's start off with the discussion of the well-mixed situation. We have these four strategies. Um, 
could be in a grid, but then if people are interacting with the grid, they would interact either with everybody in the grid, I mean, the neighborhood would be very large, or people would be interacting with randomly chosen neighbors from all over the grid. And that would both be implementations of a well-mixed situation. And uh, it turns out that in that situation, again, a tragedy of the commons is the result. Um, and actually, it's even more tragic than that because the mechanism is as follows. Somehow, there's a competition between cooperators and moralists. Moralists have to bear extra costs for the punishment, and so they have a lower payoff, which means that neighbors would not imitate them. They would rather uh, imitate cooperators, so cooperators uh, would be spreading, and moralists would eventually disappear. But once uh, cooperators are losing their friends, the moralists, they're, they're not doing anything harmful to them, actually. They're also cooperative. Uh, but once the moralists are gone, actually, there's nobody anymore who would punish the defectors. So then we end up with the normal prisoner's dilemma where, of course, defectors are spreading because they don't have to bear the contribution to the public good. So once uh, the cooperators have crowded out the moralists, they're burying their own grave in some sense. So this is really tragic. But now look what happens if we have neighborhood interactions within a limited neighborhood. And we're starting off over here with uh, all the fear of four different strategies, 25% uh, each, randomly distributed all over the place. And uh, what you can see is that in the first stage, actually, defection is spreading. So there's a majority of red colored individuals, so non-cooperative behavior really is spreading over here. But you see another thing, that again we have uh, a segregation phenomenon over here, and that turns out to be crucial, because as a result of that segregation, now cooperators and moralists don't have to compete directly, they're segregated, okay? Now they're actually both uh, competing with with the defectors. Uh, here is a good example. Okay, so blue and red are struggling with each other, and red and green are struggling with each other. And we know that uh, cooperators don't have a chance against the defectors, but uh, moralists can punish defectors. And uh, so what happens is that defectors spread as compared to the cooperators, uh, but the moralists are spreading as compared uh, to the defectors. And so, while in the beginning we have a majority of defectors, and in the second stage we have a majority of cooperators, in the end uh, we have a situation where more of this prevail. So that means the, we have just the opposite outcome, rather than defection by everybody, uh, we have a lot of uh, cooperativeness in the system, and um, people are also punishing non-cooperative behavior. And here is a simulation that shows you that dynamics. This is quite unexpected, but in a very simple way, it explains why we don't have a second order free rider dilemma. So you can see that spatial interactions, again, are key for the understanding and uh, so, in the social sciences, we should uh, spend much more attention on um, spatial interaction of all kinds. There are also many other interesting phenomena in the same model, such as uh, uh, an unholy symbiosis of moralists and immoralists uh, in certain parameter areas, namely over here. So here is so-called phase diagrams uh, that show you what would be the possible outcomes as a function of parameters of the model, such as punishment, fine, and cost, and also the synergy factor that uh, goes into the public goods game. Um, so in particular, you can see that you have to have a large enough fine in order to promote the spreading of more or less, 
And on the other hand, if you spend uh, a higher cost on punishment than that, you won't uh, reach a difference. So it's very important to identify the right threshold. And also there are other interesting effects, such as uh, actually a few defectors are uh, promoting the spreading of more or less as compared to cooperators. Now we've also heard um, questions about antisocial punishment as compared to pro-social punishment. Uh, we have been looking here at another experiment where um, people could migrate according to the success-driven rule that I've indicated before. And uh, over here, people don't either cooperate or defect, but they have a certain probability of cooperating or defecting. So that probability can be a continuous variable that is changing over time. So what you can see is an outcome of this dynamics um, as a function of certain parameters is that if you don't have this punishment option and basically defection prevails, but with punishment option, there is quite a significant uh, parameter range where suddenly cooperation can spread. And actually, the spreading of the cooperation is correlated with the punishment of defectors, uh, which is suddenly occurring even if we start with zero punishment of defectors. And then, on the other hand, there is another area in the parameter space where we have actually antisocial punishment. That means punishment of cooperators. So both of it can be actually understood. And uh, in fact, uh, depending on the parameter combination, we ca can find the emergence of pro-social punishment, starting from zero punishment in the beginning, or the emergence actually of antisocial punishment. So that is really interesting. So in a society where is n there is no punishment and no cooperation in the beginning, through the co-evolution uh, of uh, cooperation and uh, punishment, somehow co um, punishment and uh, cooperation uh, will uh, suddenly spread. Now, social norms is another interesting subject actually to talk about. And, um, Many people have discussed social norms in the context of uh, cooperation games. Um, I would actually contradict uh, to this to a certain extent. I think these are two different problems, and social norms is a separate subject uh, to talk about, and of equal importance actually to understand social behavior. I'm a little bit under a pressure of time, so I'll uh, speed up a little bit. What we have done over here is that we have assumed two populations with incompatible preferences. So population one refers to, the, um, to behavior one, and uh, uh, population two prefers to show behavior two. Um, it's uh, rewarding to show the preferred behavior, but also to show the same behavior as an interaction partner that is randomly chosen with a certain neighborhood. That is the assumption of uh, this simulation over here. It turns out to be a, um, of a stack hunt kind of interaction. I'll come back to this later on. And now we can find that there are kind of three possible outcomes. One outcome is that everyone tends to show the own preferred behavior, kind of a less preferred society. But there could also be a situation where population one sets the norm. That means um, one population, population two, namely, would adapt the behavior to the preferences of population one. And there's, of course, also the other situation where population one adapts to population two. And um, what we also find is that not only the outcome depends on the relative size of uh, the populations and on the reward structure, but also on the initial conditions. So the outcome is history dependent, as we know that actually from social norms. That is uh, very interesting as well. And then finally, um, if we are assuming local interactions and we only within a small radius, then we actually find the emergence of local cultures. So uh, blue and red are actually the preferred behaviors. 
but you can see that we are ending up with areas which are red and yellow, so one population has adjusted locally to the other population. And also we have areas where we have blue and green where the other population has adjusted. Um, and actually that's the situation that we find in the world that uh, we have local cultures, local norms, and um, so that comes out quite naturally over here. Now the most interesting case, however, is when we have a situation where actually behaviors would coexist, but where people at the same time apply something like an adaptive group pressure. So assume that um, people are shy to put pressure on others if uh, there is not a majority for that uh, um, behavior then they would just tolerate what other people are doing. But assume that there is a, a large majority um, in the neighborhood of a certain behavior, people would start uh, putting pressure on people not behaving according to the majority behavior. This is what we mean with adaptive group pressure. And what happens then in a scenario where actually both uh, preferred behaviors could coexist, we find that after some time, again by coincidence, we find local majorities. And that local majority will build up a local group pressure. And eventually, that causes a breakout of a social norm under conditions where we would not expect it to happen through those feedback effects. Again, um, that would not happen without noise in the system, but we know that uh, actually social systems are quite noisy. Now, as I indicated, um, uh, the game we're talking about uh, here in the context of understanding the emergence of one of several possible norms um, in a situation where one norm is not preset, this is the multi-population stack hunt game over here. Uh, but one could, could look also, of course, at multi-population persons dilemma games, snow drift games, harmony games, and so on and so on. And you can see there's a large uh, variety of different outcomes that we can find. And uh, I'm skipping over a few transparencies over here. But in particular, uh, there are a number of social and biological mechanisms that are transforming a prisoner's dilemma in a way that promotes cooperation in a, in a normal prisoner's dilemma game. The question is, do all those mechanisms also promote the formation of social norms? And that would be important in order to see is uh, the emergence of cooperation the same thing as emergence of social norms. It turns out, no, uh, not all mechanisms would promote the emergence of social norms. Some of them would, actually. So starting off with a prisoner's dilemma, the transformative effect by direct reciprocity, it means uh, repeated interactions, by indirect reciprocity, reputation effects, and punishment actually does promote uh, the formation of social norms. But also it can happen through other mechanisms, such as kin selection, of a prisoner's dilemma would uh, be transformed into this area of the harmony game, or we would end up uh, through certain kinds of network interaction in this no drift game. And then let's have a look at what happens in these kind of different situations. So um, here, for the prisoner's dilemma, we, we find, of course, uh, the breakdown of cooperation. For the um, second game, we, we find the for formation of shared behavior, behaviors, that means social norms. But it could also have the formation of subcultures, uh, where each population basically does uh, what it prefers. And just remember, that was actually expected for genetic inheritance. And in fact, um, cultural and ethnical um, correlations are quite obvious in our world. 
And then finally, there are situations where conflicts would result in actually even revolutions where we can have sudden transitions by very small parameter changes in, in the payoff structure, sudden transitions from a situation where one population uh, would do what uh, the other population prefers to a situation where that population would do what it likes. So that is the typical um, revolutionary situation that we're facing, for example, at the moment in Northern Africa. Now, I could end up actually with some real-life examples also from traffic theory, so it turns out that Trying to optimize traffic control locally at each intersection actually establishes something like a social dilemma situation. And such a control would not work well. It means it does not establish a system optimal situ situation because there's not enough coordination between uh, neighboring uh, traffic lights. And in order to overcome this dilemma, you need to have better rules that actually take into account um, what is happening in the neighborhood. You can see over here that we found actually rules that allow to synchronize traffic and reach a very well coordinated situation, again by self-organization. And um, in, in some sense, that's a very nice practical application of game theory, uh, which actually benefits Everyone, I mean, people who use public transport, people who use their cars, pedestrians and cyclists, and also it benefits environment. So um, let me finish with this. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to hear your questions. Two-dimensional model is simple in comparison to real life. And we know from physics that the results may be different if it's not two-dimensional. And real network is uh, without uh, dimensional limitation. Do you try to do something to check all this uh, simulation in more than two-dimensional model? Absolutely, that's a good point. And, uh in context with our publications, we have actually checked quite a number of different scenarios and also, in particular, we have replaced uh, spatial 2D interactions by network interactions and the uh, findings that we've made stay basically the same. So, um, what I have been reporting about today is not sensitive uh, to, to the many variations that we've been looking at. Right, okay, um, let me answer as follows. First of all, I would love to see a book that actually is summarizing all the major stylized facts of the social sciences. That would be extremely helpful because that would be a very good orientation for everybody who is building models and kind of the ultimate challenge to reproduce as many of these style aspects as possible. So at least I was uh, trying not to pick just one or two style aspects that happen to, to fit the model, but to first identify a long list actually of different findings that we, um, there are out there and then try to reproduce them all at the same time. Um, but I agree, the ultimate challenge is actually to formulate predictions and um, to test it in the laboratory or in real life. And actually, for that, the phase diagrams that I've presented today, I mean, this is a phase diagram, for example, or also this is uh, our four phase diagrams, they somehow say what kind of system outcome is expected if we increase this parameter or that parameter or so. Of course, I would not expect that 
um, the model is predictive in the sense that this line is exactly here because you know, real life is messy. But if we would make experiments, I would expect at least that uh, the empirical phase diagram bears some similarity with this, and lines may be shifted or so. But overall, um, if the empirical phase diagram that hopefully one day we'll be able to identify through a large number of experiments, uh, I would hope that that would uh, look similar, and that would really be a breakthrough, I, I think. Uh, we have been successful doing that actually for traffic flows, where there is a number of different kinds of congestion, stop and go waves, homogeneous congested traffic, and a number of other kinds of congested traffic. And uh, we came up with a theory that was predicting what were the flow conditions under which uh, we would find this kind of uh, traffic congestion or that kind, and so on and so on. And then years later, we uh, got hands on data sets, actually, of real freeways. Uh, it took uh, another few years, actually, to evaluate the data, but they were fitting quite well to the theory. So I hope we can do the same kind of exercise for these kinds of models over time. Not necessarily all in my lab, but I'll be happy to collaborate with others or advise any experiments done in that direction. <laughs>